As you'll remember, Peter was both the leader of all of the other 12 disciples. How did he become leader? Who knows? Maybe it was when Jesus says, you are Peter and upon this rock. But no, he was a leader before that. He was a leader in his relationship with his three family members as they as they got together, Simon and Andrew, uh, Simon Peter and uh, Andrew, his brother, and James and John, they had their little fishing business. He was always the one getting into the boat first. He was always the one ahead of the rest. How does a person become a leader? Well, they're just usually at the meetings before everyone else. They're doing the work that needs to get done. They're, uh, they're, they're just called of God and they do it. Peter was called of God. And was he a perfect disciple? No, I'm so glad he wasn't. I'm so glad that the lessons in life of Peter, the failures of Peter, are things that we can identify with. Don't you just love the fact that he sticks his foot in his mouth, not once, not twice, but half a dozen times? Like, that's so like us. I say us because I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure some of you have that issue. You know, speak when you shouldn't be speaking and the silent when you should be, should be speaking. You know, it's, it's so like mankind. Peter was a leader. He was a gifted artisan. He was sharp and insightful. He was impulsive. He was, wow, impulsive. You know, they're in the middle of the lake. It's a bad storm. It's four in the morning. Like who goes on the lake at four? Well, they did because they were following what Jesus told them to do. But a storm was there. And there's Jesus coming, walking on the waves. And he says, if it's you, Lord, you just tell me to come and I'm coming. Who, have you ever had that happen? Where you say something, why did I say that? I bet you that was that moment for Peter. I bet you he looked around and said, did I just say that? Oh my, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, yeah. I, if that's if that is really Jesus out there, he's gonna tell me. I come, Peter, <laughs> and all of a sudden he's going. I never thought that this was going to happen, but he just bounds out of there, and he bounds across those waves towards Jesus. But then he sees the big waves, he gets his eyes off Jesus. Isn't that so much like ourselves? We got going through the day and everything is flying so perfectly. And then something slams us on the right side and something slams us on the left side and something hits us on the head. And all of a sudden we're going, oh, oh, what happened there? And, and we think that God didn't see the whole thing. The omnipotent God sees it all. And he's saying, lesson time. Peter, Peter, keep your eyes on me. Keep looking at me, don't look at the others, don't look at the boat, don't look at the waves, keep your eyes on me. So when we look at First and Second Peter, and we're gonna get a, a fair bit of that because um, some of the messages that will be coming in the next few weeks will be on First Peter. So we're getting a really keen insight into the disciple Peter, but also what really concerns him. As a, a person now in his aged moments of life, you get smarter when you get older or you just get forgetful. I find myself making the same old mistakes that I made when I was a young person. I don't know, maybe I'm just unique in that respect. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. <laughs> I just want you to know though, that we should be growing, as he says, growing in godliness. And that that's what he wants to see in the lives of the believers. Now in 2 Peter chapter one, where we stopped, he said, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world thinks that what you have in your hands called the Bible is a fable. It's not just a book. It's not just a very good book. It's not just a very good book about very good truths. It's nonsense. It's fairy tales to the world. I met one person very recently who said exactly that. You can't trust it. It's all fairy tales. Well, Peter makes a point of saying that right in his introduction in verse 16. He says, 
we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, I don't know about you, but verse 16, he says, we've not followed cunningly devised fables. I think it's, it's actually myths. And he says, now, I want you to know we were there. If somebody says to you, this Bible that you hold in your hands was not written by the people that claim to be the people that they are, you just point them out to this verse. Because here, Peter is saying, I was there. I am a witness. And the one thing you can't do about a witness, you cannot challenge the veracity of their words when they say, this is what happened. You weren't there. And so somebody says they were telling stories, they made it up, it's all a fiction. You say, well, they said it wasn't. They were witnesses. And the one thing you aren't is you aren't a witness. This is 2,000 years later. And then they'll say, but you cannot trust this to be an accurate account of what was originally happening. Because who has played that little game where you whisper in somebody's ear something and they whisper to the next person and the third person. By the time it comes around 12 people, it's nothing like what was said originally. Well, let me share with you a very accurate truth. And that is the word of God is different than a whisper. It was the written word. And you don't mess with somebody's writing. If you, uh, for example, are quoting somebody, you want to quote the whole quote. And if you're marking, if you're saying, well, this is what somebody said in their report, you want to say where it says it so that people can go back and look it up and check it out. The person that was writing here, Peter, is not the printed ink that you have on your copy right now because we're 2,000 plus years. However, what we have was we have accurate manuscripts that go back to as early as about 35 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. That's how old the oldest manuscripts, they are in existence in museums. You can go visit them. So for, for people who say, we don't have any, any truth in what is in the Word of God, we sure do. You can trust the Word of God. Not a paraphrase, not a, not a, um, a massage to paraphrase, because there are thoughts that are embedded in those to help us. But you've got to look at the difference between a translation and a paraphrase. Translation is either word for word or thought for thought, but it's still accurate, okay? He says, we were eyewitnesses. When were they eyewitnesses? Well, let's take an example, Matthew 17, one to five. This is the eyewitness account of Peter as he's describing what took place on that particular day. So Matthew 17 says it this way. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. Now, six days later, Jesus took Peter. So Matthew verifies that Peter was there. Oh, that's really good, because if you have an eyewitness and you have somebody else says, yes, I'm, I'm agreeing with that you were there. How does Matthew, how is Matthew able to know that? Because he was a disciple. And guess what? He wasn't there but he saw them go off the mountain. There was only three of them that accompanied the Lord Jesus on that mountain. Matthew wasn't one of them. But he says, this is what happened. How do we know? Because he was relaying what the other disciples explained to him afterwards. So he's testifying to the eyewitness account of Peter and James and John. And, uh, no, was it James and John? Yeah, those were the three. James, John, and Peter were the three closest ones. That, even Andrew, the one that brought Peter, wasn't, wasn't up there. Pretty cool. Andrew was probably trying to find somebody else to reach. So he goes on to say, six days later, Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up to the high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. The word transfigured is the word transformed. It's the word metamorphosized. It's a word that, that, that is used of an insect when it goes into its shell and comes out from a grubby little grub and comes out to a beautiful butterfly or a beautiful moth. It's that instant 
They saw something. They saw someone, not something. They saw someones, three. And they saw him become as white, snow clothes become as white as light. His face shone, and Moses and Elijah appeared. Moses, he'd been dead for centuries. Elijah, he'd been dead for centuries. How does this happen? And what are they doing? They're talking about, as one of the other accounts reveals, they're talking about Jesus coming to go to the path of death as well. Well, Peter puts his foot in his mouth, verse 4. Peter answered and said to him, now I'm not sure who he was answering. You know, the word answered implies that somebody's questioning you usually. But it seems like he's speaking. He's like initiating something here. And Peter, in his normal, uh, impulsive way, says, Oh, Lord, first of all, good going. We're glad to be here. And uh, if you want us, we can, we can make three, three tents for you. I don't know whether it's because it was so cold on the mountain that day. And they wanted some, he thought it might be good to have some shelter for them. Or whether he was trying to suggest that the tabernacle that was for the, Je for the Jehovah in the Old Testament would be the same kind of thing he would do for Jesus and Elijah and for Moses. And Elijah representing the prophets, Moses representing the law, and Jesus representing the grace of God. I don't know. I, I will not know for sure. But while he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. This is the Son of my love. Now, they recognized this was God, Jehovah speaking. And they also recognized that somehow Jesus was God. They're already getting intimations of that because he's already spoken to the Samaritan woman. And he says, I am the Messiah. He's already declared many times that he is the, the answer to everyone's needs. Well, this is God. And he's received worship from the man born and blind. And, and he's come to him and received worship and never told him not to worship. So Jesus is, in fact, the second person of the Trinity. And they're starting to realize that. And while he was still speaking, he said, this is my beloved son. And the disciples heard it. They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. And Jesus came and touched him and said, rise, do not be afraid. Isn't that the way of Jesus? He's constantly touching us and saying, don't fear. It might look mighty stormy out there. It might look mighty crazy in this world. It might look like it's chaos going on in the wars and rumors of wars. But let me tell you, do not be afraid. I am with you. And you know, when I was a younger lad, I could get afraid, but as soon as my father showed up, I was no longer afraid. And that's the way it was with the disciples. As soon as Jesus showed up, they were not afraid. And they saw no one but Jesus only. And that is a reminder too that Jesus doesn't share his glory with any others. That's said from the Old Testament as well. And the scriptures is clear, he will not share his glory with another. So in this passage, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he received from God the Father honor and glory with such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He's quoting again what happened. We heard this voice which came down from heaven when we were with him on the holy mount. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. What is he saying? He's saying when God is giving a confirmation we were eyewitnesses, so you don't have to worry. If I'm saying something about the future, it's a word as if God has given it to you. And so we can trust it, knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Have you ever met somebody like that? They're constantly coming up with some really wacko versions of the Bible and interpretations. And they, and they take a verse out of context here, and they take another verse out of context here, and then take a third verse out of context, and they put them all together, and it makes a nice little salad of out-of-context verses. And you end up with a confused doctrine. The Word of God is consistent. It doesn't speak one thing in the old and another thing in the old. I remember there's been people who've preached from pulpits in the north here who said you get saved a different way in the, in the Old Testament than you do in the new. And I said, 
That doesn't sound like Hebrews 11 to me, where the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 11 said, it was by faith these were made just. Abraham was declared faith. And in Genesis we have, he believed, and that was counted to him as righteousness. There is no saved by the law in the old and saved by faith in the new. It is all <laughs> saved by faith. What was the law to do? It was make you aware how fallen short you were from God's standard. And Jeremiah, over and over again, he's saying, you don't obey the law. You seek after this. You do that. And uh, he says, in fact, Paul echoes him when he says in Romans chapter 7, he says that that little last command, thou shalt not covet. It was the command that got to me because I couldn't stop wanting something I couldn't have. He was coveting. And that coveting drove him to his knees. It drove him to despair. It drove him to Jesus. And it's hopeful that we will realize that someone needs not just the law to convict, they need the Savior to convince and bring into salvation. And so Peter, as he writes, he says, no prophecy came by the will of man. Do you think these men sat down and, well, I want to become a millionaire, so I'll just start a new religion and say, thus says the Lord. No, no, no. You've got a prophet like Jonah who's running the opposite way and has to have a great fish swallow him and throw him out of, the, <coughs> out of his mouth in full of whatever vomitous stuff smells like from a, a big fish. I've caught up in a few fish my then. They don't smell very good, you know? And he had to endure that for, what, three days? And this is the facts of the matter. Over and over again, when you read the Old Testament, you read the story of the prophets, and you say, these guys did not want to be prophets. They were prophets because God said so. And they came to realize that they had a divine mission. Jeremiah, I mean, reading through Jeremiah this, this past uh, couple of weeks, and here he is, he's prophesying and he's saying things, and in one moment he gets cast into a well, and uh, he's, he's just kind of like Joseph, feels a lot like Job because he says to, to, the, to the people that he's writing to, he says, oh, I wish I cursed the day I was born. I wish... God had just cursed. I just wish I'd never been born. So you, these are men of flesh. They were, they were weak as you and I feel weakness. But they were touching the God of this universe. And so Peter, he says, but there will be also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. This is, we need this today. There are plenty of false teachers among the church of Jesus today. They masquerade with their big, expensive jets and planes. They masquerade as prosperous teachers of grace and prosperity. They masquerade as those who can help you learn the magic of wealth. They masquerade as those who can teach you the, the elixir for health. And they're a bundle of lies. And so we need to be careful what ones we listen to. There's been some things that have been happening recently that have reminded me again and again that you can test, as Jesus said, the person by their fruits. And a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. So out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks. And there are people today that have great movements, but they do not have great fruit. And there needs to be fruit. And Paul, uh, Peter, as he speaks to the believers in his day, he says they are secretly bringing in destructive heresies, verse 1, even denying the Lord who bought them. Now, it doesn't say that they're children of the Lord. It's saying that all of mankind has been potentially bought by the blood of Jesus. Remember that, please. There's no one of us that gets to heaven because we were good enough. You know, you see a person that's, that's 
somebody says, oh yeah, that person's a believer, and you go, how could that be possible? You know, because of the lifestyle they've lived, and you may not know about their, their change in heart, you may not know about what has taken place inside them, because they have never revealed that to you. But you say, how is that possible? And you think to yourself, how is it possible that I can be a Christian? You know, there by the grace of God, that is only possible. It's the mercy of God. And so he says they brought distinctive her uh, heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. That doesn't mean that they were believers. And bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow the destructive ways. What are the most prosperous churches today? They're the ones that don't preach the gospel, for the most part. Um, I wish I could say that it was otherwise, but we're not really seeing the revival yet, but we're seeing some judgment coming upon the world. And I believe that the, that will be the precursor to the revival that we will see. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Blasphemed by what? Covetousness. There it is again. Covetousness is the sin that can attract the sinner. You want to get better? Look this way, look in this direction, and I will help you get better. I will help you have a higher bank account. I will help you have that gold that is going to take you through the coming tough times. This is what is being preached today. Unfortunately, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not about how much gold is in your account. It's how much gold you're putting into heaven's account. And he says that we cannot take anything with us. I love what Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus arise and walk. He didn't need gold or silver to cause a miracle. He only needed the interaction of the Lord Jesus and the willingness of the Lord Jesus. And here is one of those examples where Peter, he speaks impulsively, you would say, but no, he's speaking right on because that was meant to happen. And so it's not about covetousness. He goes on to say in verses four through to the end, he speaks about the various ones that are experiencing at that present time um, false teachers. And he goes on to say, this is what God is doing. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. You wanna read a little more about that? Take a look at Jude. Jude has some more information about those who've been reserved, those angels who've been reserved for judgment. And then, of course, you get more discussed about this. Verse 5, he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. So he's talking to a people. Now remember, there's a lot of active persecution of Christians at that point in time. It is said of, uh, of Caesar Nero, uh, that they were, they, Christians were experiencing some of the worst persecution they could ever experience. And at that time, people were saying, well, are we not in the tribulation? Are we not in the right time when Jesus should be coming back by now? Well, he says, he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight, a preacher of righteousness. So what is he saying? Don't worry about the others. Just you be that preacher of righteousness. Don't worry about the others. He'll take care of you in your own way and in your own time, just as he did Noah. And he delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct, verse seven, of the wicked. And that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. You know, if you're like so many people today, you might like to surf the net. And you might like to look at this article and look at that article. And there's a story about somebody who killed all their family. And there's another story about somebody who, uh, who was uh, uh, doing some very nasty deeds on an island someplace. And there's another story about, about the efforts of, of the agendas of the, of the wicked today in the political world. You know, you could just circle down into a despair of depression if you kept looking at that all the time. We need to be reminded, like Peter 
And like the Hebrews said, fixing our eyes on Jesus. If we were to spend as much time reading the word of God as looking at the internet and surfing the net, or perhaps even listening to Fox or some of the other news broadcasts, um, we would discover our life was much richer and our heart was more uh, confident because we'd be turning to the one who said all things are possible. Don't be afraid. Whereas the world preaches a steady diet of fear and buy. Fear and market this, you know. Um, you've got to be afraid of this coming, so you better have all this set before you. And it's all about fear motivating people to buy. It's capitalism at its worst. It used to be the buying was to help make life better. I, I'll give you a quite a good example. I remember watching a, a little documentary on a person who built themselves an underground shelter. They were convinced beyond that they were going to experience the tribulation. They were getting ready. They stockpiled this thing and they set it in motion. They locked the door and they said, now I'm going to come back and I'm going to keep an eye on it, make sure everything's good but I'm gonna be ready for that day. I'll have my bug out bag and all the other things they talk about. And I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna be ready to go to survive whatever Holocaust is coming our way. 17 years later, they open this underground shelter. It's rather nice, I mean, it's simple, but it's nice, it's stocked. There's still you know, hundreds of tins of goods and all of this food that's now spoiled. Um, does not anybody rem be, you know, think about this when they say, uh, I'm getting ready for something that's going to happen, that food as a shelf years out of certain foods that are preserved, and that is about it. So do you want to spend the rest of your days before God preserving food, then trying to eat up all the food before the preserving dates are over and everything and getting a nice little belly out of the deal, and then going back and preserving it again? because you've got to keep doing this cycle. And it's like slavery. When God says, preach the word in season, out of season, give out the word of God that people might come to faith in Jesus. Our highest priority, our highest calling is to reach the lost with the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And there's so many people today that are spending all their reserves, all their time, all their efforts, simply to try to build this cocoon around them of protection. What's the favorite expression that everybody says when you leave? Be safe. Can you be safe? Can I be safe? No. But we can be in the arms of Jesus, and that's sufficient. And so, we'll stop at verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. He knows how to deliver you and I out of temptations, too. We have unique temptations in our day. But we have unique opportunities for where there is a challenge there is an opportunity for blessing and so let us go before the Lord and say Lord what can I do to reach my neighbors with the gospel what can you ask you said to me to love my neighbors as myself I, I, I know you I want my neighbors to know you how can I do that and as we seek to win our neighbors, our communities, our country, God will do great things. Revival starts first with you and me. It doesn't start in a big crowd. It starts with you and me as individuals. And when our hearts are revived, somebody once said, I think it might have been even John in one of his messages, that the way to revival is prayer. Sincere heartfelt prayer. And was it not you, John, that said that there was a great group of people underneath the church where either Spurgeon or Moody was preaching and they were, they were praying fervently. It may not have been you, but I'm going to give it you the credit. Uh, um, in my memory, as is, is, is imperfect as it, it is, I thought it was you. And uh, just to say that we need to be praying for revival and pray that the Lord of the harvest would give more time. Wouldn't you like to be able to say, walk into heaven and you see somebody go, what? I witnessed you once. But maybe that was the seed that germinated. And they come up and say, if you hadn't given me that tract, 
if you hadn't stopped to show interest in me, I wouldn't be here. Wouldn't it be glorious to see a party going on in heaven and somehow somebody at your funeral has gotten saved and you're asking an angel, hey, what's going on over there? You guys are really having a blast. What's happening? Ah, oh, didn't you see? I'll give you a little glimpse. People are getting saved by the, by the bountiful. And that's why we're rejoicing. What a, what a delight. So may God bless us. As we look through, I guess we'll have to stop at verse 10 on chapter 2. We're slowly making our way through it, but I wish I could be a little faster, but it's just, it's more than we can chew in, in the time that we're chewing it. So.